Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to CDFI Fundamentals, a path for entrepreneurial success. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and I am a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. So as you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So definitely make sure to check out those links and resources in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you are dialing in from in the chat. We always love to connect. And second, we are going to open up for a live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions for us in that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And we will try our best to get to all of them. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, BMO, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Cincini, Woodruff Sawyer, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, we like to launch a few polls just to step back, see how everyone in the room is doing today. This first one is going to ask, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? I'll give this just a moment for people to submit a response here. Thank you. Thank you. Going to end this poll and share these results. Awesome. We love to see optimism in the lead, but definitely have some feelings of fear, anxiety, and surviving. Hopefully some of what we talk about today will help address some of those feelings. I'm going to stop sharing this poll and launch that second poll. What is keeping you up at night? finance, sales, marketing, scale, pivot, team, or surviving. And this one just tells us a little bit more about your current entrepreneurial needs so we can continue to provide relevant programming to all of you. Awesome. We got folks from Arizona, Texas, California, Michigan, Chicago, Iran, North Carolina, United Kingdom, New York. Welcome, welcome, everyone. So great to have you all dialing in here. I'm going to end this poll, share these results. All right, looks like finance taking the lead, fitting for our conversation today, but definitely have needs all across the board. Uh, so thank you for sharing. I'm going to stop sharing this poll. And then we just have a couple additional polls related to this conversation today. So this one's going to ask, how did you start your capital journey? CDFI, bootstrapping, bank, haven't started yet or other. Um, and this one, you know, will just help kind of guide the conversation today. So much appreciated for your responses. I'm going to give it just another moment here. Awesome. All right. Going to end this poll and share these results. All right. looks like bootstrapping is taking the lead, but also looks like some people have had experience with banking and others haven't started yet. So really, really helpful. I'm going to stop sharing this poll and launch the second one, which is going to ask, how long have you been in business? Zero years, zero to two years, three to five years, six to 10 years, or 11 plus years. I'll give this one just one more moment for people to respond. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to end this poll, share these results. All right. looks like most people are kind of in that zero to two years, but really all across the board here. So thank you all for participating in these polls. This is super helpful for our conversation today. Going to stop sharing that and without any further delay, please join me in giving a special warm welcome to our moderator today, Paloma Vision, Lead for Commercial Women's Business Development Strategy at BMO. Paloma, it's always so great to have you on with us, and I'm going to pass it right over to you. Thank you, Michelle, and it's always a pleasure to join you. Um, so good day to all of you who've joined us. 
Um, I was excited to, or I don't know, excited. I was interested to see that no one has used the CDFI to fund their business. So, you know, today is going to be perfect for you because we are going to deep dive into the world of community development financial institutions, commonly referred to by the acronym CDFI which are basically financial institutions that provide credit and financial services to underserved markets and populations. And the population we're specifically talking about is that underserved kind of small business, early stage business loan. Um, CDFIs are actually a relatively new capital pathway and they actually originated in the 1990s. So today I want you to kind of get ready for the fact that we're going to cover these key takeaways. You can expect to learn what CDFI are, CDFIs are, how they support businesses, and hint, it's not just with capital, and why they are a great option for debt financing. One other thing this entire group will want you to take out of today is debt is not a bad word. But before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to properly introduce myself and our panelists. My name is Paloma Vigen, and I'm part of BMO's commercial banking team. At BMO, our mission is to boldly grow the good in business and in life. And I have the privilege to do that daily by working on strategies and programs to support women business owners and leaders to thrive. Today, I am joined by a powerhouse of small business champions, so please join me in welcoming Titi Ikile, the Chief Program Officer at Working Solutions. I will also note I serve on the board for Working Solutions, so I'm very passionate about CDFIs and the, that organization in particular. Flossie Hall, CEO of Stella and Serial Entrepreneur. And last but not least, my colleague, Ronald Millsap, who's the Director of our U.S. Zero Barriers to Business Program at BMO. Welcome, Ron. So um, before we get started, I'd love to have each of you just share a little bit more about your background and the businesses that you work at. So TT, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Paloma, uh, for having me here. And um, again, my name is Titi Kille. I'm Chief Program Officer of Working Solutions CDFI. Uh, we are a CDFI here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Northern California. And um, and so really uh, my co-work has been supporting uh, small businesses and uh, with um, ensuring that we can create more awareness about CDFIs uh, through our network in community engagement, talking to banks, talking to um, our community partners, and then also providing consulting support to our business. Um, and I was a former banker. I worked with a couple of different banks, so I definitely have a great appreciation for the banking support that's necessary in this space. And also I'm a former entrepreneur as well. I still have some businesses as well. So kind of have an understanding of just, you know, some of the pain points that businesses have gone through. So thank you for having me. Thank you, TT Flossie. Hi, so happy to be here. Um, as you said, I'm the CEO of Stella Foundation. We're a nonprofit headquartered in San Diego. We help women entrepreneurs from ideation to pre-seed to get them as capital ready as possible, no matter what capital pathway that looks like. Um, but as you mentioned, I'm a former entrepreneur and current entrepreneur. I built my first business over a decade ago. Um, we did seven figures in our first year. And I tell everyone I like to teach people how not to build a business because that's what I did the first time. Um, but I went on to build entrepreneurial education and programming in the veteran space, the military spouse space, and now in the women's space. So um, not only do I have the joy of building businesses, but I get to put my hands in so many other people's businesses and helping them on their journeys. That's awesome. And I'm sure tomorrow's a big day for you, given it is Veterans Day tomorrow. Or, well, we're observing it yeah. tomorrow. So thank you. It's a busy week this week, always. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And last but definitely not least, Ron, share more about yourself. I'm a native Chicagoan. I'm, I'm based here uh, in our headquarters uh, in, in Chicago. As you stated uh, before, Paloma, I lead our U.S. Zero Barriers to Business program. That's a special purpose credit program where we're serving women, Black, Latinx and Native American small businesses across our footprint. Uh, we are operating in over 22 states um, through a thousand retail branches, providing working capital lines of credit to support small businesses. Uh, I joined BMO uh, as a, uh, for my former institution where I was a CRA officer. I spent the better part of my entire career in community banking, uh, starting as a teller um, into the role that I'm in today. So I've had a lot of opportunities to work in different areas and different roles within the banking uh, industry. But nothing gives me more joy and more passion than to be working with CDFIs, nonprofit organizations, and BIPOC small business owners. Um, and BMO provided that platform. It was a 
primarily the main reason I joined the bank. Um, I lead a, a bold team uh, of business development officers and a strong program manager that, that really do so much work to lift our program and make the impact that we're making across our footprint. And I'm pleased to be here with you all today and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. So if you can't tell, again, we have a awesome group um, that are all going to be champions of every single one of you that are attending today. So um, let's dive into our content. So we really are going to focus on CDFIs, but it's not uncommon that entrepreneurs, you know, fund their business in a variety of different ways. Um, Ron, I'm going to start with you on this one, but I'm sure Flossy and TT, if you want to add anything, um, please do so. But Ron, what are kind of the typical options an entrepreneur has to initially fund their business? Um, and, you know, People go a variety of different channels on this one. <laughs> um, we, we could say you could start with personal finances or AKA um, bootstrapping um, in terms of how most people um, you know, look to start a business and kind of get going. Um, there's also the opportunity to look at you know, crowdfunding as a, as a primary source of how you uh, get the initial capital to start your business. We talk family and friends um, being able to support a business. Often the statistics don't support that for a lot of you know, BIPOC small business owners. Um, and then there's the, the loans and debt, like in a form of a SBA loan or traditional bank loan. Equity, which we know like is really not a conversation for a lot of our small business. And in fact, like 1% of all funds get access to VC funding. And for minorities, it's even a much smaller slice of total VC funding. Um, so, I, I mean, like you look at those buckets, like what are the pros and cons of each? I, I really think about personal finances as a way like there's no get rich quick scheme. There's disciplines and behaviors around building success. And even for someone who may not come from means, um, when you have a determination that you want to do something, you can make sacrifices. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen um, in my own family. I've seen it happen with other business owners. So it starts with like understand that you have complete control over your financial situation, that you truly can begin to think about what things you can do to begin to save and put money aside. Um, you get to grow at your own pace, if you will. You're not pressured by any kind of outside investors or anybody in your business when you're starting from a bootstrapping standpoint. Um, but it, it can be taxing um, from a from a kind standpoint because it takes a lot of time to save. And to, to grow a business, you're sitting on a great idea and you, you're stumped because you want to move faster than what your own funds would do for you. Um, family and friends, it, it, it can be complicated working with family, um, but it also would be a great benefit because they may will give you terms and conditions that, that other folks wouldn't do. And they may believe in you. They may guarantee or come into that loan situation that kind of help support you along the way. Um, and then, like, I look at the, the debt scenario. And oftentimes when we think about conventional finance and you have to have a proven track record and, you know, cash flows to kind of support uh, looking at traditional debt. Um, but when you do get access to conventional debt and or debt coming from CDFIs or other places, it can create a predictable stream of, of payments and how you manage those things. Um, so like whether it's, you know, bootstrapping, crowdfunding, friends and family, um, VC or debt, those are those are the primary means in which we, we see businesses being funded. And I think in this space, we start crossing a lot of those off, at, at least in terms of perception and what data shows for BIPOC small businesses. So I say, you know, I'm proud to be an institution that also provides grant funding for women-owned businesses. Uh, I'm proud to be connected to CDFIs um, that are the first to believe in your business in terms of working capital uh, solutions. So uh, I'd love my colleagues to be able to chime in on this one, but, uh, I think it's it's a combination of things when you're thinking about the unique audience that we're serving and going beyond just the traditional way we think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I, I loved that uh, call out to first to believe, which I'm sure TT will comment on shortly. But Flossie, you know, um, you work with entrepreneurs, um, as, as you said, and getting them capital ready. What are, you know, are there other things that Ron hasn't mentioned that you see sometimes entrepreneurs start in terms of uh, building their capital for their business? 
Yeah. So I think I love all the solutions that Ron gave, but I'd also like to add um, there's tons of grants out there for women, people of color, um, different industry specific grants. So don't overlook grants even as a for-profit business. Um, there's also pitch contests. So learn how to pitch your business. I love to teach founders to go leverage pitch competitions. And I know founders who've leveraged six figures in income just from pitch competitions. So go out there and get the money. Um, and then you can also leverage angel and venture capital if you get to that point. So angel investing is actually a really big deal. Um, people can write you personal checks um, and it's not as scary as venture. Um, so I think there's lots of paths to capital, but I always believe in building a revenue first business if possible. As a small business owner, you need to make money. Um, so even if you're going after capital for support or gasoline, you still have to make money in your business. So I think part of those core foundations is really helping founders understand their revenue models and making sure that they're sustainable and scalable um, while also getting some of that extra support in various ways. That's a, that's a great call out on revenue first um, and capital second. Um, but TT, anything else you'd want to add to this? Um, yeah, I think it's really great um, on, on the options that Flossie and Ron had mentioned. I'll also add on crowdfunding, as I think Flossie mentioned, and leveraging network uh, for Angel. But you can also leverage your customer base um, and your uh, social capital, meaning people know you in the network uh, for the value that you bring to, to the work or to your product and um, use that to accelerate revenue. Um, and to also raise funds. And I've seen somebody take that and raise about $100,000 from crowdfunding and then leverage that to go get another additional working capital. Uh, so, so there are different methodologies on um, pathways uh, for this capital at early stage. Great. Um, so let's get into CDFIs though. Um, and TT, you, you live, live and breathe this. Um, how do CDFIs work? Um, and I think next secondary question, which I think will be critical, how can a finder, a founder find one in their area? So let's start with just the basics. How do they work? Yeah. So, well, um, first, you know, I think Paloma gave a little bit of overview of what a CDFI is. Um, uh, it's really, if you look at the word community development financial institution, it's a financial institution uh, and there are different kinds of it. Uh, but I'll focus on the ones that's relevant for this conversation, which is really for small businesses. And in that case, what really is distinctly different uh, from the bank is that most uh, CDFIs center the community in their focus uh, stacks. They're trying to get the capital out into community communities that might not be able to um, to, to get it from uh, traditional means, especially the early stage borrowers that tend to have more of a risk um, and they don't have that you know, proof of concept. And so most CDFIs function in a way of think about like you've got, you know, you got to ride your bike and you, you know, you're five years old and you can't jump on your parents' bike. You need that tricycle, you need those, you know, training wheels, you know, that help you to kind of just balance well and so that, you know, you don't end up being traumatized and just leave like bike riding forever. So it's the same thing with like basic capital. CDFI brings in a support system um, to, to give you capital that's a common basis and also the support of like consulting, of like the network, of just, you know, helping you understand um, just what it means to borrow, uh, what it means to manage a business, what it means to, um, to also expand your network and then give you kind of the right tools that helps you move into more of a traditional lending space and the comfort that comes with that as well. Um, so that's typically, you know, on the small business lending side. And then as far as where to get, I'm going to drop something in the, in the chat. Um, there is a, this, uh, from our industry association called OFN, Opportunity Finance Network, in which we're part of, uh, Working Solutions, one of uh, our CEO is on the board. And they have an amazing um, CDFI locator. And so if you click on the link there, you'll be able to plug in your zip code to plug in where you are across the nation and be able to find a CDFI that's close to you. There are hundreds of them now. And so so there, there's one for um, that, that I'm sure that's close by to everybody. I love that. And one of the things I really wanted to just highlight again, uh, TT talked about consulting. If you're coming to visit any of the CDFI websites, if you go to the OFN and find one locally, you will notice they'll notate how many technical hours they are putting out to help support business owners. And I think that's one of those just 
secret sauce ingredients on why CDFIs are so great when you're early in your funding journey and how they can really help not just with capital, but really help to get you to that stage, um, you know, to, to be a little bit more successful and be able to thrive um, with a with a thoughtful business. So um, again, that's something huge that I think is um, unexpected that CDFIs offer. Uh, now, Flossie, in your intro, you said you basically teach people to do what you you didn't do to start your entrepreneurial journey. Um, can you actually go in and share what that, you know, your startup journey was like, what, what you did and maybe where you would have made some changes? Yeah, so I was an accidental entrepreneur. Um, I started a home-based business and quickly scaled it to seven figures in 11 months, which is insane when you don't know what you're doing. Um, so even though I was bringing in all this money, close to $100,000 a month, I didn't understand my financials. I didn't understand my margins. I didn't understand my pricing points. And I did need capital, but I went to a big bank and they said, you're not eligible. You haven't been in business at least two years. You need to check all these boxes. It's basically like an automatic decline, no matter what you're doing or how successful you are. And I didn't understand that. So I took out predatory working capital loans where you borrow 50,000, but you pay back 70 and then you end up in this vicious cycle because you just need money and you don't know where to get it. Um, but then I stumbled across CDFIs, which I had never heard of. So I started working with Axion and CDC Small Business in San Diego, and they gave me people. <laughs> Just like TT said, I got a support network. It was very relationship centric where they dove into my business. We built out a full business plan. They helped to make sure I understood my financials and the foundations of my business, my growth strategy, my revenue strategy. They helped me to get healthy and really understand the core basics of what I needed to be successful. They didn't just write me a check. They literally were part of the success journey of my company. And I honestly couldn't have done it without either of these companies because they just gave me a whole team. It was like, you're drowning as an entrepreneur always, and you're trying to get out of it and do what you can. But these people came and just lifted me up and they really helped me understand and be successful in my business. So I say I did a whole bunch of things wrong because I did. I did it wrong twice before I did it right. Um, but CDFIs are more than just capital, which is what I really love. Yeah, you know, that's that's awesome. And I I I'm glad you 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 found them um in and you know eventually um and I think Flossie, I'd love to get your perspective since you do work with a lot of business owners. Why do you think CDFIs are maybe something people aren't aware of um in your perspective? Do you think it's just because they are kind of a newer product? They're not, you know, something you find at your bank. What what's your kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it comes from at education and awareness. So doing things like this, I saw that nobody is using CDFIs. I also didn't know it was an option. So you're used to just being able to like walk into a big bank and say, I need money, but you don't understand the differences in banking industries and like who you're getting on the other side of that table. So I think education on what CDFIs are, why they're so important and continuing to spread awareness on why small business owners need to be leveraging them in their, their capital pathways. No, I, I will share. Um, I was in wealth management till about 2020 um, and 12 years into my banking career. I had not heard of a CDFI until then, which I am like so embarrassed to admit. But I again, it's it's not even as well known as we should be in the banking industry. So um, I think if every single person on this call can take that away and, and share with someone in their network what a CDFI is, that would be huge. Um, so TT, coming back to CDFIs, what exactly does an entrepreneur need to apply for a loan through a CDFI? Is it just as similar to a traditional bank loan? Um, you know, what are maybe they going to do differently coming to you? And um, I think, you know, what are some other kind of like best practices you would share when an entrepreneur comes to a CDFI? Yeah. So um, kind of same, same thing, using the analogy of, of, a, of a training wheels um, and riding a bike. Um, our ultimate goal is to try to get you to, to continue to grow in terms of like having options of capital, because the more options you have, the more freedom you have. Uh, and, so, and, and so most CDFIs, and I'll kind of speak from working solutions perspective, because we tend to kind of fall in similar pathways for, with other uh, small business CDFI. And someone comes in the door, they might have already been, they might just 
thinking of an idea, a phase, and they've maybe they have to do that in another company and they try want to transition out of a company to starting their own consulting private business. Um, and so for most part, we would want to see a business plan because we want to make sure that you've thought it through, that you have clarity about where you're going in the business. Um, the industry experience matters. Um, and so having at least a year of experience or paid experience in the industry helps to to, uh, to know that you have a bit of uh, clarity about what are potential risks are along the way, and you've you've mapped that out. Um, and then um, then we want to also know that you'll have some clarity about what the use of funds will be. Sometimes people come in the door, some of the kind of things that could be a red flag is if you just say, I just need as much as I can get. That might not be the best approach. You'll want to do some number crunching, just to kind of get a rough list of, okay, I need to buy tables, I need marketing costs, and just, you know, make a total cost of that. You might not be able to get everything, but at least it gives us a benchmark of, okay, there is some understanding of how this money will be used properly. Um, and then, you know, in terms of once you kind of have that clarity, you have a good roadmap, you know what you want. Uh, most applications are very pretty quick. Uh, they just really want, they're not so much credit centric, they're not credit score centric in, in most uh, CDFIs. They really want to understand your story because to Floss's point, is relational. It's relational. And so we really want to know what's the story behind the credit. So you've had some mistakes, you've had some bad, some bad years. Uh, tell us what you're doing now. What tell us the pathway. So it's more restorative. We we take working solutions take more of a restorative approach in how we lend. And so um, we will take a bet on somebody that might have had a 500 credit score. How do we do that? Because we give them phases and we can, we can build up over time. So for example, somebody can get 10,000 today, in six months, they can come back for another 20,000. And so the progressive um, improvement that you see could earn you opportunity to slowly scale in a way that's healthy for your business. And then the documentations, those are all, everything is virtual based. So just have the same list of documents that you can get, you know, your profit and loss just helps us to know how much you're making or how much you intend to make. Um, and then just formation documents to just make sure that the, the businesses have been registered properly. Um, and once your you know decision is made on it, it's really, we just want to know how, can you afford this payment? Can you afford the loan payments? Um, and that's the critical part of the decision making. And if that could be a yes, what I we tell people is that there are three uh, potential outcomes that you could get. You could get a full yes with everything you ask for. You could get a partial yes with something or you can get not yet. And all these threes are wins. Um, and why are they wins? Because the not yet is some, we give you some feedback of what you can do to come back. Um, and we've seen a lot of our uh, borrowers that initial decline, we give them some steps, they come back in six months, we're able to turn it around for a year. So, so those are the practical steps. I love that. Um, and I'm just going to reference a, a, a different if I set up a little bit differently, but like Grameen America, which was founded off of Muhammad Yunus's uh, principles, something he built out in India, you know, their average loan size is actually twenty six hundred dollars. Um, but that amount of capital infusion can be so powerful. So I think as, as TT hinted at you may not need to go for these massive loan sizes just to get your business off the ground. And then to Flossie's bigger point, just so you can operate and get that revenue flowing, you might not need this massive capital infusion. So um, it's a really interesting experience. Um, so even if you go to a CDFI, you actually still want to start establishing a relationship with a bank. Um, because you may not be getting debt from them um, and, and lending, um, but you still have other answer, ancillary services you need to actually run your business. Um, can, Ron, can you talk a little bit more about why it's also important, regardless of what strategy you're going to get that you know first business bank account established um, and why that's so critical to that business continuing to grow? First, I just want to demystify like some of the untrust that there is in the banking institution. And I get that from different community lenses, we've been told to put it under a mattress, buried it in the sand, can't trust the bank, don't show them all your assets, don't 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 give them the full picture of kind of where you're standing financially. Um, and even that relates to some of, some of our tax strategies in terms of how we report um, different things on our, on our tax returns from a personal and a business perspective. So I want to tell you those things hurt you um, be, and be very clear and intentional about that you, you think about with any presentation of how you want your business to show up. You want to show up professionally. You want to have records that back all your transaction activity. Not only that, 
for uh, your own purposes, but for that of your investors, uh, uh, the banks you deal with, the accountants, uh, a good accountant could take your bank statement and make a PL and, and tell you everything going on with your business. So it starts with like the basic building blocks, um, the basic blocking and tackling. Um, and I, I tell people that you, you need a team and, and a banker is absolutely a part of that team. And I love the ecosystem of how banks and CDFIs partner because to your point, Paloma, you absolutely need a banking relationship. You need a deposit transaction history. You need cash management products to help you manage your, your, your cash flow, pay your bills, pay your employees. Um, and I, and I, I just feel like don't, don't take those things for granted because they're really going to help differentiate you. You want to segregate your personal from your business. Having that business account also puts you in a position to start building business credit. All these are like basic fundamentals, um, but don't take it for granted. Don't continue to co-mingle funds, um, work from your personal account, use you know, Zelle or some of the non-bank financial options that are out there to, to do your record keeping and invoice creation. You want to mix a conventional bank into that process. And more than anything, you want to develop a relationship with the banker. Um, you know, going into that branch, meeting the branch manager, meeting those database bankers are keys to unlocking a phased approach, not only growing in the CDFI, but begin to grow in the banking space, right? So we start at business banking, we go to commercial banking, we go to private banking, uh, capital markets. So like, you can start today with us, get a loan from a CDFI, eventually grow to a loan with BMO, end up in our commercial bank, and end up raising VC capital and, and working in our capital markets group. Those are the stories that we want to be a part of. And believe it or not, it starts with a bank account. <laughs> I, I love that, Ron. And it's one of those simple things. But I think that the key one you probably hit on, and I, Philosophy, I'd love if you want to add anything to this too, but that stop commingling funds. That one will get you into trouble. So the sooner you can start, stop doing that, establish just that your own business deposit account, that is, is crucial. Um, but yeah, Flossie, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I just want to add value that the very, one of the biggest things that I learned as an entrepreneur that's been a key to all of my success is your bail team. Just like you said, your banker, your accountant, insurance, and a lawyer, get those people together on your side and protect you and build the path forward. And to TT's point, that's where the CDFIs come in. They give you that team before you get the money. They help you to get the money. And then afterwards, they help to make sure you're on the right track with that money. So it's a, it's a bail team is what I teach everyone. Get your people, get them on the same page and work together towards success because they will protect you and help build those solid foundations for you to, to build the tallest of skyscrapers on. Um, I'm totally stealing that acronym. I always think of banker, accountant, lawyer, but adding the insurance is also critical. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to start using that. So thank you. Um, so that segues really nicely into, you know, TT, what do businesses experience in terms of like, how long does a CDFI typically stay with them? Like as a business scales, how do you kind of continue to prepare them for a traditional banking relationship or, you know, maybe even that next stage if they are, you know, super fast growing and need to go the VC or angel route? Yeah, that's a very great question. So because we pair cons consultant with our capital, we tend to have a long relationship. I mean, I would say 10 years, 18 years, you know, with, with our clients. Um, and, and then somebody says something, they say, you know, you're doing something right if they, they're still in business after 10 years and they invite you to their 10 year anniversary. That means there's a relational component to it. Um, and so uh, for us, I think that value of, of just keeping in touch is key um, and the support system of knowing that we are sounding board even as they're growing. Um, so because there's an intentional connection that we have, we're looking for the ones that are in active like consulting support with us. We're looking for ways to help uh, de-risk them and to look at what their pathway of growth is. If we see, okay, there are a lot of like growth potential and they're scaling fast, then we know that they might cap out at the kind of lending capacity that we have. So we're looking at other lenders that we can refer them to or, you know, their banks, where do they bank? Like to Ronald's point, how you have to have a bank account before you get money from CDFI because we're not going to drop that money cash in your, in your house. We have to deposit it into a bank account. So definitely the account matters and the separation is even more critical. Um, and so for us, it's like, where's your home bank? Okay, is there a relationship there? No, okay, can we find somebody there that can help you 
leverage that relationship that you have already with your deposit account. If that is not suitable, it's not quite a fit, then we try to help them find other pathways. So that could be other CDFI. Sometimes it could be other, um, you know, VC connections, uh, equity, you know, pathways um, that they need to grow the business, uh, depending on the nature of the business. I'll give an example. I don't, we had just a client that's been with us for like one of the first loans that we did in the organization. It's a jewelry business, women owned. And they're looking to buy, buy property and reached out. I mean, they've been in business for like 15 years plus and they reach out back to us because we've had the connection. Why do they need us? They just want, where could I go? What Can you advise me on just like what are the best options and what's available right now? We're able to kind of give them some, just get, get an understanding of the pathway they're going and help give some options uh, to, to them. So those are the, the support system that you have you know, I love that. I'm still in that from Fossey, like that bail team. I uh, work in, in, in CDFIs and uh, I'll say from working solutions perspective, we call ourselves first to believe and we keep believing in you um, and still stay connected to you. Um, and so you, there's always an open door of reaching back out and um, to, to get help. Love that. And, you know, Flossy through the solutions that Stella helps offer to its community, um, are there anything kind of else that you help to, you know, move someone on from that CDFI onto a traditional banking relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's capital pathway is different. It depends on your business and what you need and where you're going. So we always start with what does success mean to you? Success can just mean working for yourself and making enough money to support and sustain your family, or it can mean a scalable business that's going to go IPO one day. So those capital pathways are going to be incredibly different based on where founders are going. So we basically help them to discover all of the potential options and how to piece multiple options together to get to the same path of success. So you can use grants, you can use pitch competitions, crowdfunding, bootstrapping, friends and family, and then roll into angel and investment if you need to. Um, but it's incredibly important to um, use each piece and each tool at your disposal based on where you're at in your in your journey. But you do need that banking team to come together, not just with the actual money. But like I said, I, I met with a big bank this morning who had free banking resources. They had multiple like um, equity management platforms that I didn't even know existed. But if I didn't have those conversations with my banker, um, it wouldn't be a tool that I would have in my toolkit towards my success. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Um, so Ron, obviously, you know, BMO, we have our special purpose credit program, but in general, uh, when a business owner is ready to take on bank debt, you know, what should they expect, especially maybe coming from that CDFI world um, and transitioning into to a bank for their lending needs? You know, TT took this one on earlier and she really just almost like covered this question. Like I really <laughs> couldn't add anything more perfect to how she described you know, how you need to have a business plan, how you need to really think about your cost involved and being able to um, come in and request the debt that you need to move your business forward. Generally speaking, you know, especially like if, you, if you're not comfortable going to a bank, you're not familiar with the loan process in terms of what documentation you would need, and you're at that stage of your company where you believe that you are in a place where you can take on debt and have the means to be able to repay it, Leverage the ecosystem of the technical consultants that are out there. Working Solutions could sit down with you just the same, help you with your business plan, help you evaluate um, what you actually need to borrow. We see mostly, you know, especially about BIPOC small businesses, like they don't get enough capital even when they're seeking capital because they don't know what to ask for and they haven't really planned and put in buffers. Like, you know, you go in, you, need, you think you need 100,000, you probably need. 150 because there's there's things that are going to happen throughout the course of the process of you investing in that business things that you can't account for things that you didn't plan for so sometimes getting less it is it, 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 worse than getting you know funding at all when i really think about like the trajectory of how it can put your business in a bad spot so have your uh, obviously your financial documents in a row um work with a good accountant. What is a good accountant? One that's been referred to you or that you've worked with and had from experience, someone that's really specialized in your industry that can have you not just prepare the books, but have you fundamentally understand your business and your cash flows. Um, and, and come in with that 
that piece already in place. So you know I can actually take on this debt. I can borrow it. I'm not afraid to borrow it. Um, it's going to help me buy that piece of equipment. It's going to help me hire those new employees. It's going to help me start this new line. And you got projections of what the ROI is on that and what the net present value of those things would be in terms of being able to move the business forward. That gives conviction to your banker that we feel really strong about going in and supporting you. In business banking, we invested millions of dollars in an automated platform that can give you real and near time decision. And when you come in and apply for a loan, we have underwriting metrics, industry metrics, all that stuff kind of built into that, that system. But if it's bad data coming in because you really haven't done your homework before coming in and sussing out that need for debt, then you may not get exactly what you need. I like also what TG said, like in all three scenarios, whether you um, get all of, of that you need, a little bit of what you need, or it's a not right now, we try to give our, our clients understanding. So, so, so really trying to explain to them that banks are really traditional places that you go to look for debt. We're not venture capitalists. We're not here to take the big bet, take the swing out of the park, take the biggest risk. Um, we're here to actually look at a, a sustainable track record of performance, experience within your industry, and just those things that give anybody confidence. This is a good business that can come back and repay this loan. So as you, if you're not quite sure, you may want to start with those small business development centers and those counselors. I've been amazed, Paloma, in my banking career that we do more due diligence for a home mortgage than we do sometimes for business lending. That, that, that folks get declined for home mortgages that are able to get business loans. And it's always kind of like, you know, kind of like left me kind of myth. When you're a first time home buyer, you go through a home ownership class. You, you, you have to put all your expenses and all your incomes up. And that bank really wants to make sure you can afford that home mortgage before you give it. If, it, if, it's, if, it's, a, if it's a good lender, they really want to make sure they pitch you in a home that you can afford and that you're not going to have any issues with. And I think we need to think a little bit practically, like, do I step into this debt, into the unknown, or do I try to prepare myself as much as possible beforehand? I love that. And I, I think it, it says a lot about the industry, too. I think, um, and, it, you know, Flossie and I were talking about this yesterday. You knew there's a, we, I think we all notice it. There is a, a lack of financial literacy when it comes to personal finances. But I think it's even more shocking when you start to talk about it from a small business entrepreneurship side of financial literacy. And we're in a country that is built on the backs of entrepreneurs. So, um, no, it's something I think we can all spend more time on um, and help support and connect people to education as needed. Um, so to kind of wrap up our journey, I do want to go on that, that path and Flossie stick with you on this one. But, you know, if we do have a company that's on a high growth trajectory and probably needs to go with an equity capital infusion, you know, what are those options? Um, how should they be exploring those future capital needs if they're in that boat? Yeah, so I'm, we work to get to founders to pre-seed and seed round. That's kind of what we do at Stella, but we wanna get them investment ready. So working with women, especially, and people of color, there's a financial vulnerability that we have to talk about first, like being able to openly and honestly share your personal finances and your business finances, but be open and receptive to getting support to get you capital ready. So even in the investment landscape right now, they want to see that you have other forms of capital, that you have bootstrap, that you do have revenue, you do have traction, you have tried crowdfunding or equity crowdfunding or some grants. They want you to have some of those on your journey to get there because they want to see that you've put in the work. I think the days are gone where you have an idea on a napkin and you pitch a couple of people and they write you a million dollar check. They really want to fund businesses that are going to be strong, stable and successful one day. So I think investors are being more careful on who they're investing in, but they want to see that you've done the work up front. So don't be afraid to go out and get the various forms of capital from CDFIs to pitch competitions, because it's going to go in your traction and it's going to show that you're willing to do what it takes to make your business successful. So then you're going to be a good steward of that investment by continuing to do that at a bigger, better scale. It's more fuel for your fire. 
capital is not a goal to like for venture capital to just like start it, build it and see if it works. <laughs> um, I think those days are gone. I think it's now more gasoline to pour onto the fire that you've already created. So think of it that way. They still want you to come in and, and have some of these other forms, um, but it's definitely a great way to scale and scale at a much faster rate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we got two final questions. So kind of a speed round for our, for all three of us. So then we can move into some live Q&A. Um, but probably this one, don't go too speedy. So first of all, what are the common barriers you're seeing for early stage small businesses that come, whether to a CDFI or a bank, uh, for those early stage of capital infusions? So like, what are those biggest challenges and how do you support the, them to overcome those barriers? I'll start with you, TT, on this one. Yeah, um, one is it's just a readiness around their documentation. Um, many businesses just don't have prioritized um, preparing their profit and loss and making sure that it's ready. Um, and so they spend time trying to scramble to get somebody to even get this ready. That tends to be one of the biggest barriers to even getting them into the door to be able to like be assessed properly. Um, and um, what we try to do is well, to to uh, manage that, we, we provided like a smaller dollar amount that requires less on a uh, weight on that where we can do a review, like so up to $10,000, you come in for just like a bank statement um, and we can uh, we can still assess you for, for capital. And then what happens is that you get connected to a business consulting team and we put it on you, like you've got to get this together and we work with you, provide classes. And so by the time you come back for more capital, now you have a PNL that you understand um, and that you can either self-prepare or you can have somebody prepare for you. So. Thank you. Um, Velocity, what's some of the things you see in the, the clients you work with? Yeah, so I think just touching on it, it's that financial psychology. Women are typically grateful and incredibly passive when it comes to asking for money. We want to have all of our ducks in the row and we'd be like, well, I'm just grateful if I got $10,000 when they should really be asking for 50 or a hundred, or I'd be grateful with 250, but they should be raising a million plus. So some of the financial psychology of going through everything that TT said and really helping them to understand their ask and what they need and to feel like they're worthy of that by showing them other successful women like them that are doing it and raising it. So we need to get better at speaking up. I say a closed mouth doesn't get fed. You have to ask for the money in order to get the money. Um, and it's really difficult as women. I find a lot of women that have a hard time asking for money or asking for help. So I think working with other people, mentors, other successful business owners, and getting that confidence that you deserve it um, and that you have the confidence to, to be good stewards of the funding in your business, I think it's really important to surround yourself with great people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ron, what's what's maybe your most common barrier you're seeing um, coming into the bank? And the, the biggest challenge for, for a lot of businesses that we serve is capital access, which we all know. And some of the biggest barriers that I see coming in is the lack of uh, financial uh, education and some of the behavior um, in terms of their personal and or business credit even before coming to see us. It's like a lot of bad decisions were made. And you're at the point that you're seeking a conventional provider for financing and you just don't fit inside of a box um, that most traditional banks have. Uh, what I've been really proud of is the work that Beam has done to really create a nuanced, specialized uh, credit box that expands our credit risk, um, gives pricing discounts to the women, Black, Latinx and Native businesses that we serve, and just provide a whole resource uh, of tools, webinars, cash flow calculators, business plans, all free and available from our website. In addition to uh, webinars like we're doing here today and partnerships like we have with Working Capital Solutions, across our footprint, we have a number of community development financial institutions that we partner with directly. We try to create an ecosystem whereby if we can't help you, we're directing you to a partner that can do a little bit more of that triage work and bring you back to us. And then we're developing product and solutions that complement what those city of and other nonprofits are doing. So we we want to be in the space. We want to take on some of the risk with you. And we want to grow this client base together. We want to all sit collectively and think about conversations like these and some of the clients that we're serving today. And then, you know, have them working with Flossie in five to 10 years from now because they, they, they're ready to get some real uh, capital and scale their businesses. So we're, we're part of the solution, um, but we could definitely continue to use more players uh, helping us out and moving this forward. Thank you, Ron. 
I think you all actually indirectly answered my final question, which was how do we get capital to underrepresented and female founders? But I think maybe the one thing I'd love to just like finish on before we go to live Q&A is how can we all help support the, like, the movement to getting more capital to women, underrepresented founders, even if we're not in a financial institution? What can we do to help support those businesses? Uh, Flossie, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, so a lot of the work we do at Stella is to teach women uh, to write more checks because if women are becoming investors and investing in other companies, they're typically investing in women-owned businesses. So a lot of what we advocate for is putting them in the rooms with women or that they are because they're not encountering the same barriers. So working with women, if you're pitching a male investor, it's a different conversation. It's a different paradigm. Um, they're being negatively talked to instead of positively talked to. So a big part of what we do is we try to advocate for more women and people of color to write checks, become investors, give them permission, teach them how to become an angel investor or equity or whatever that looks like so that more capital eventually starts to tilt. It's been 2% capital for women for the last 40 years. The needle hasn't moved less than 1% for people of color. And literally the only way we can do it is to get more people writing checks or distributing capital like Ron and TT to those communities. So just continue to support, buy, purchase, share, um, cheer, mentor, but write the checks at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, Ron, what's your kind of key way we can all move the needle? You know, you have to be intentional. Um, it, we didn't get here uh, with those type of statistics that that, that uh, Flossie just shared about how businesses of color and women get funded. Um, those are practices and intentions. And I think as we look out in the world of the businesses that we advocate, the work that we do, that we really speak up when we see injustice, um, we really have to continue to be very progressive. I want to say the George Floyd uh, uh, situation, as well as the, the pandemic, it brought on so many new tools, resources, funding and capital, um, banks supporting great work, CDFI supporting great work. I think the CDFI industry really, um, for those who didn't know much about it, the amount of capital that they get out to the community through PPP loans and the things of that nature. So you start to see the level of advocacy really start to creep up. And it, it shouldn't be anything that's... Um, that's on any kind of political line. Um, we're talking about being proud Americans, supporting our communities, and having everybody have the same good access to education, quality food, the ability to work and play in their community. So for me, it's going to put my head down, continue to work. We've been able to support over, you know, nearly 4,000 small businesses through the work in the past three years to the tune of about $80 million in capital. But that's not the biggest story. It's those unique organizations, small business that we've supported, that we've given new hope to and shown them that there are people out there in the universe that really want to move the needle on this work and are really intentional about doing so. Thank you. Thank you. And Titi, last but not least, uh, how do you think we can all help to move the needle? Yeah, really, I mean, it takes a village. We all got, kind of have to look at areas where we're interacting. Uh, Flossie's mentioned about putting money in it, uh, but you can also um, buy from them um, and speak up and use your voice in social media for advocating. You know, this is powerful. This is powerful of just helping putting more. You know, getting their sales up. You see, okay, this is an underrepresented. You know, um, owner of a, of a business in your neighborhood, and you feel like, man, I want to do something more. It just starts with just that one that you think you can touch. Um, and then if you're at a place of, of, of influence, then being able to advocate for more of this change that's in the national level, um, that really helps to make policies and makes it easier for folks to be able to participate in contracts, government contracts, uh, prioritizing those that might not have a voice and be able to be in, in those spaces. I think that's where we start. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's try to take a few of these questions. Um, Titi, this one's probably a good one for you and maybe Flossie if you need to weigh in. Uh, I We have a financial education instructor. Uh, what are the ways that they can help to partner with CDFIs and kind of get the word out around CDFIs? 
We'll, well, I would say reach out to to us, uh, myself and Flossy. But the, I mean, we are always looking for partners. We work so well and with educators, both folks that are bringing financial literacy credit building, uh, because both are the front end of businesses. Businesses coming to the door and the ones that actually have to get capital. We want to make sure that they're well networked and resourced. And so our partners, we have like a resource guide that we share with our clients, and we have newsletter that goes out. So we definitely would love to connect. Um, please um, reach out via LinkedIn. I'll drop my email as well. Thank you. Um, another one, we have someone who um, is actually a refugee status looking for funding. Um, I guess Flossie and I, TT, I'd love to get your, your two cents. Um, where can they access capital? Because I'm sure, you know, potentially if they don't have a green card status, what are the options in the U.S. to get, get a business started? Um, I actually, we actually do a loan for ITIN, which is like uh, tax ID numbers, um, which you don't have to have a social security in my way. We've been doing that loan for a while. Um, you know, I also happen to be kind of on the board of a refugee organization. Um, it's a national organization that I can also drop in here as well. Um, so there are other resources like a CDFI is not one size fits all. If it doesn't fit with inside of a, of a working solutions or other, there might be other options um, that could be a fit. Um, and so so that CDFI network is a great one. I also drop the highest EAF, depending on where the person is located. Uh, that could also be there. There might be a different options available. Thank you. And Flossie, anything else that you would add to that? No, I think TT nailed it. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> I think perfect. she's the person you need to. <laughs> um, this last one, I think, is a good one for Ron and Flossie, um, both because I know BMO provides grants, but Flossie, you probably know about other places where it's the best place to get a list um, of organizations that do provide grants to business owners. Oh, off the so top anybody... of my mind. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Flossie. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to say um, there was a lot listed in there from Hello Alice to um, Verizon Small Business, but Co by the Chamber of Commerce actually has a very exhaustive list that stays updated every single month. Um, sign up for their newsletter. They send it out every month, but you can also check their website and they usually have anywhere between 15 to 30 grants for various demographics, regions, and, and companies. So it's a very big aggregate list that I've found has been really beneficial for entrepreneurs. Thank yeah. you. And Ron? Uh, I was going to shout out Hello Alice. So uh, Flossie, yes. give me to the punch there. But also look out uh, for BMO. Um, go to BMO, follow us at Zero Barriers uh, to Business. Um, in the first quarter of F24, we're going to be putting out a grant program. This will be our third year of our Celebrating Women grant program. Um, we're up in the ante. The past two years, we've, we've been able to support uh, eight women, um, you know, 16 in total. So eight each year with $10,000 grants. Uh, to help support their business. And uh, with our expanded footprint, we're gonna be looking to double down, um, support even more women business owners and get more grant capital out there. We realize that $10,000 is a nice sweet spot. Um, we want you to use that grant capital because we've seen so many businesses take that 10,000 and multiply it many times over, um, give back to your communities, and we'd love to have you as clients. So that's not a requirement for our grant program that you have to be a BMO customer. So we wanna get out there into the communities that we serve, um, but obviously we'd love to thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so so that's, that's just one additional source to look out for. Great. Okay. So we've got less than a minute. Um, five second key takeaway for each of you. Uh, Flossie, I'll start with you. Uh, find the good programs. Lots of them were already listed here. Sign up, join, do the work, surround yourself with great people. Great. Ron, 10 seconds. Bail team, you're not alone. Don't ever say that you're alone. Do it together. Leverage all the resources that you heard about today. Uh, we're here and we're ready to help. Thank you. And TT. Uh, Ron took my bail team advice. <laughs> but I'm going to go with this. This is a famous one I just used this morning. If you didn't succeed, succeed the first time, dust yourself off and try again. That came from a music, a music musicians, by the way. It's not me. But really, <laughs> it's always going to be another opportunity to try again. So try again oh, oh, and find okay. yourself. Uh, that's Aaliyah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's what I was going to say. It's Aaliyah. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, 
I loved that that R and B reference. Um, yeah. But I think that the one thing I'll just take away before we turn back to Michelle, debt is not a bad thing. Uh, learn about these programs, share these programs. I know you all know another business owner, and this might be something that they need to help their business succeed. So Michelle, back to you, and thank you to this panel. Awesome. Paloma, Titi, Flossie, Ronald. Thank you all so much for just sharing an incredible overview and, and all of your unique perspectives are super valuable. Um, and on behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, we're just so grateful that you all joined us today. So thank you very much. Awesome. And to our audience, we would love for you to join us again for upcoming webinars, which you can view using that link that's going to be posted in the chat. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you back online with us soon.